Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the session. What I'd like to talk about today is, of course, our vision, how we see the market, how do we fit in the market, where is the future going? And maybe to do that, let's remind ourselves, why did I start Palo Alto Networks 15 years ago? Well, I did it, of course, to change the cybersecurity industry. I'm not one of those entrepreneurs that thinks about how to make a little thing or not a little thing better and go after a small market. I want to change the entire market. And to change the entire market, of course, I go after the challenge with the market, which is the way the market has evolved. Every time a new challenge appeared in cybersecurity, the large vendors, some of which are my previous employers, either ignored it or miserably failed at addressing it. So a new set of vendors was created to address the challenge. And very quickly, many organizations around the world, many of you ended up finding themselves in a situation where you have dozens of cybersecurity vendors selling you dozens of cybersecurity solutions just so that you can achieve your cybersecurity goals. And that, of course, doesn't make any sense. I know it makes sense to a lot of you. Uh, it used to make sense to me, but that's, hey, that's the way it should be. No. It's not. It doesn't make sense that the cybersecurity industry is different than any other industry where you only have one, two, maybe five vendors selling you solutions for that specific area. You probably have one, maybe two ERP vendors and ITSM vendors and HR vendors, and maybe you have five networking vendors and so on. I don't know. How many desktop vendors do you have? How many server vendors do you have? How many cloud vendors do you have selling you public clouds? Are you in 20 different public clouds? You're not. So why so many cybersecurity vendors? Well, again, this is the way the industry has evolved. And I started Palo Alto Networks to change that. And the first area we attacked, as you know, is network security, where besides building the best firewall in the world that many of you are using, uh, firewall that is really solid using app ID and user ID and content ID rather than my previous inventions that were inspection at its core. And great, it's the best firewall around. But maybe sometimes overlooked or taken for granted, one of the main uh, advantages of the firewall, one of the main things that the firewall has done in the industry is to take all these little things that usually were sitting in network locations around the firewall and turn them into a subscription service delivered on top of the firewall, right? So over time, and believe me, it was really, really hard to convince many of you to do that, but I'm thankful that many of you have chosen to, to take this approach that we've been uh, preaching to you for the last 13 years, and you've thrown out your IPSs and network-based anti-malware and subscribed to threat prevention, and you throw out your proxies and content filters and URL filters and so on and subscribe to PanDB, and you replaced your sandbox if you had one with wildfire. And now you're adding IoT security and you're adding DNS security and you're adding uh, any, uh, network traffic analysis, NPA and UEPA uh, and DLP and many other things as a subscription service on top of the firewall. In that sense, Rather than just creating the world's best firewall, we also created what I call an integration machine, an engineering integration machine, a way that very quickly after we either develop or acquire a new network security function, we integrate it into the single platform and deliver it as a service on top of the firewall. For example, one of um, our relatively recent acquisitions, Zinbox, an IoT security vendor, like many other vendors in the IoT space, they required their customers prior to the acquisition to deploy sensors all over the network, yet another appliance in the network, collect data, process the data, and help you with IoT security. We acquired them, and very quickly we turned what they did, in our opinion, the best IoT security technology in the world, to a service running on top of the firewall. So in that respect, the firewall is an integration machine, and for those of you that have, been, that have been with us for many, many years, you probably remember the beginning, or it was very hard for us to convince you that we have the best IPS in the world, and the best URL filter in the world, and the best sandbox in the world, and so on. But again, thank you, many of you, for trusting us and doing all those things with us. And 
you know, luckily to us, some of you are already believing us when we tell you we have the best DNA security, we have the best IoT security, and we have the best whatever it is that we run on top of the firewall. Some of you are still testing and to, to make sure that that's true. And, and that's, of course, also uh, is, is completely valid. And I understand that. And thank you also for giving us the opportunity to show you that we're the best of everything we do. And all those things that we do for network security are delivered as a service on top of the firewall. We don't need to deploy anything. And what we've done in cloud security is something. We built an integration machine. We call it Prisma Cloud. Uh, it's a single agent, single console architecture, where basically the agent can connect to your CICD pipelines. It can run inside your hosts and VMs and inside your containers or on your container hosts. Uh, it can run together with your serverless functions. It attaches to the platform services, the PaaS services that you buy from public cloud providers. So the agent can run on any compute form factor, including CACD and PaaS, in any cloud, public and private. And there is a single console that delivers many different cybersecurity functions on top of that agent. So rather than having to do what the industry is expecting you to do, which is to go and look at quite a few startups in each area, you probably know that most of the startups that have been funded in the last couple of years are cloud security startups. Uh, so rather than going and looking at many of these for each different function in cloud security, you can subscribe to the Prisma Cloud uh, model of I deploy one agent in every location and then I use one console to deliver all these different functions. Now, in Palo Alto Networks' uh, tradition, these are all based on grid. We either acquired the number one vendor or we build the number one function and integrate it into uh, Prisma Cloud, right? We acquired the number one uh, vendor in uh, cloud compliance, uh, Evident IO, we acquired the number one vendor in cloud security. Redlock acquired the number one vendor in serverless function security. PureSec acquired the number one vendor in container security. Uh, Twistlock, we acquired the number one vendor in micro segmentation uh, in, in the cloud across all compute form factors. At Pareto, we build the number one function in identity and access management analytics, the number one function in WAS, web application security, or RASP, runtime application self-protection, uh, and, and so on. And, and the plan there, of course, the strategy there, the vision there is to continue to add many more functions that traditionally in your traditional data centers you would run as a separate function from a separate vendor, usually deliver those as an integrated function into a single console, single agent, Prisma Cloud architecture on a best of breed basis. So I'm talking about Prisma Access, right, which combines all different access methods into a single platform where traditionally uh, access was designed to optimize uh, access to uh, the traditional data center. Sorry, I mean wide area networks were designed to optimize, optimize access to the traditional data center. So we, we would use something like MPLS or other private uh, IPVPN networks or even IPsec for branch offices to access the traditional data center. Uh, we would use client VPN for users, mobile users, remote users, home users, whatever, accessing the traditional data center. And we would use clientless VPN, SSL VPN, or IPsec VPN for partners to access the traditional data center. Now that applications are moving to the cloud, public cloud, and SaaS, of course, that architecture doesn't make any sense. And we have three new use cases on top of the three existing ones. We need new architecture for branch office access to the cloud, direct access to applications running in the cloud. We have uh, a need for users accessing cloud applications directly. And of course, we need uh, a solution for partners accessing our public cloud and SaaS applications directly. The industry is doing what it does best, what it was created to do, right? The DNA of the industry is we have three new challenges on top of the three existing ones. Let's ignore user access and branch access and, and partner access to the traditional data center, keep those systems in place. We're going to build three new industries for branch office access, user access, partner access to public cloud and SaaS. You want branch office access to the cloud? No problem. SD1, secure SD1. Here is the solution for you. You want, but, but keep using MPLS to access the traditional data center. Why not? Just 
one another, one other solution. Uh, you want users to access your public cloud and uh, SaaS applications? No problem, just stick a proxy in the cloud, right? Proxy, whatever. You know my opinion of proxies, but it doesn't matter to you. What's important is that here is another solution for you. For another vendor, deploy so your users can access applications in the cloud. And then for partner access to the cloud, I've seen a dozen startups at least, a dozen startups at least in that space. The jury is still out as to which approach will be uh, prevailing. I don't think any. I, I really think that the right approach is to take all these six use cases, branch office, user, partner accessing both traditional infrastructure, traditional data centers, that's three use cases, and next-gen infrastructure, public cloud and SaaS, that's another three use cases, combine all of these into a single access system. The reason I'm a little bit bummed, a little bit upset, is because here, it seems a little bit harder for us to convince the market that this is the right approach. I'm still seeing too many customers saying, oh, I have three new use cases, why don't I look for three new vendors to solve that? Why, why, why not try to solve it with a single vendor? Uh, and, and that's what we created Prisma Access for. And luckily it's easier than what we had to do with the firewall to convince most of our customers that this is the right approach. We have more and more customers, many, many very large customers that are changing their access architecture from three use cases plus three unaddressed ones, sometimes they already deployed proxy in the cloud or SD1 or something like that into, you use a single system, Prisma Access, to combine all these six use cases into a single system. So use cases into a single system. So, so what is Prisma Access? Prisma Access is, as many of you know, is a worldwide private network. It's one of the world's best networks. We're riding on top of Google's premium network, not the standard network that most GCP customers use, their premium network, plus we have extensions into other cloud providers where we're needed. Uh, we have our entire security stack deployed in, uh, I think, 28 or so data centers around the world and more than 100 pops around the world. And once you get to a pop, either using client VPN, client VPN, IPsec, SD1, once you get to a pop, you're in a completely private network. Your packets are not writing on the internet. There are SLAs, which are extremely good around latency, around bandwidth, uh, around availability. And your packet is going to be processed very, very quickly to our entire network security stack, meaning our next generation firewall, plus all the subscription services that we can turn on on top of that, plus our CASB, our cloud auto security broker, Prisma SaaS. And once processed, the packet goes on to its original destination. So whether the user is sitting in a branch office, whether they are uh, at home, whether they are mobile, at a Starbucks or something like that, uh, whether they are at the partner's uh, office, uh, whether your employee has decided to ride out the pandemic on some uh, island in the, in the Pacific or in the Caribbean, it doesn't matter. The users get the same treatment, different connectivity method, but the same treatment, same routing, same security, same peering, direct peering into all the major SaaS providers, all the public cloud providers, into all the other tier one service providers on the planet, no matter who the user is, where they are geographically, whether they're in a branch office or whether they are a user somewhere in the world or whether they are a partner, they get exactly the same treatment, the same security, and you get the same controls over them. Sounds great, right? Yes. So why are we still looking at many different solutions for access? SD1 as one solution, proxy in the cloud as another solution. And the last thing, as you probably know, we do is Cortex. Cortex is our brand for uh, security operation center automation. And uh, maybe a little bit of a story before I talk a little bit about Cortex and give you some context for uh, what you're going to hear later in this uh, uh, event. So about 10, 11 years ago, when we came out to the market with Wildfire, our sandbox solution, uh, there was really one other sandbox in the market, still in the market to some extent. And uh, the first thing that we've done in, in our competitive goal to market, why do you use Palo Alto Network? Not someone else was, we're going to deliver the sandbox as a service. We're going to deliver the sandbox as a SaaS service, Everything else will go on top of the firewall. So you don't have to deploy samples throughout the infrastructure. All you have to do is to upload 
through the firewalls. You just program the firewalls to do it. You don't deploy it. You need to upload your, your files, executables, applications, uh, documents, PDFs, and, and PowerPoints, and, and so on to the cloud. We're going to sandbox those. And if something goes wrong, if we see that the behavior of executable or the behavior of the application that opened the document is weird, we're going to tell you about it. And great, now you know about the attack. So we did it. We had good success. You know, customers like the SaaS delivery versus the on-premise delivery. It's also 10 times cheaper because you don't have to deploy very expensive devices on-premise. Uh, you, you share the, the, the ones we deployed in the cloud with, with all our other customers. And yeah, in the beginning, it was hard to convince customers to upload their files and documents to the cloud. But of course, uh, not, not before long, most customers agreed to do that. And then we found out that it's really difficult to operationalize a sandbox, not just that, any sandbox. Why? Because when we told you that this thing that just went through your network is a piece of malware, or that PDF document that just went into your infrastructure uh, exploits an unknown vulnerability in Adobe Acrobat, for example, an application that, that opens it, uh, that's when your trouble begin. Your troubles begin. As a SOC analyst, now you have to take the application, the executable, the, the, the document, and kind of reverse engineer it, or at least understand what it does in order to figure out, okay, which bad URLs are associated with this, which bad domains, which bad IPs, uh, go and figure out what's the command uh, and control connection so you can create a signature to stop it, uh, figure out whether uh, uh, there are mal there's, well, there's, sometimes mal or there's almost always malware involved, so figure out what the malware is, what other artifacts are being downloaded and installed on the victim. Uh, all of that takes a long time, and then once you figure it out, you have to figure out uh, which signature needs to be created and then distribute those signatures to people. Of course, most security operation centers in the world don't have the capabilities of doing that, and those that do don't have the capacity to do it at the rate that the adversaries are sending bad things into the infrastructure. So it became apparent that, yeah, it's easy to buy from us, right? You just write us a PO and, and at some point pay for it. It's easy to deploy. You just turn on a switch on the firewall, and all of a sudden you have a sandbox very hard to operationalize. So what, what did we do? And if you know, we took uh, uh, that process that analysts were expected to do of understanding what it is that the new piece of malware or new uh, document in the vulnerability exploit they're doing, automatically figure out what are the bad URLs, bad domains, bad IPs, crime control traffic, uh, artifacts, and things like that, create signatures for those and distribute them back to the infrastructure. All automated. In the beginning, we did it once a in 24 hours. Today, we do it in real time. If you run time with 10 uh, and, and above, you get it in near real time. You didn't step into us understanding what went wrong. You have a signature to stop it. And by the way, not just for you, but for all other uh, customers as well, uh, which is great. That's how you personalize the sandbox. When we started with our sandbox, our competitors had maybe a thousand customers, maybe 2,000 customers, and we had zero. Today, we have tens of thousands of customers using the sandbox, and our competitors are still at, you know, maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand. Why? Not because our sandbox is better, which it is. It's because it's much easier to operationalize. Great. We solved that sandbox problem. And then came the next one. We, if you remember, we acquired a network traffic analysis vendor, uh, I don't know, about four and a half years ago, uh, called LightCyber. Great product. You deploy it. We made it, of course, run on top of the firewalls. You don't have to deploy sensors. You run it, you get very high quality alerts. What do I do with it? I'm a stock analyst. Like, what, what, what do I do with it? It's, it's based on machine learning. Like, I don't understand this. I don't understand this alert. And then uh, EDR required an EDR, right? And then uh, IoT security is also uh, sometimes hard to operationalize and so on. So very quickly, we realized that all these great detection technologies and prevention technologies, if we don't make them into prevention technologies automatically or almost automatically, they're going to be very hard for our customers to, to operationalize. It's not hard to deploy. Easy to deploy with us, just a SaaS service, hard to operationalize. And then came cloud security. And it became very quickly apparent that it's very hard to operationalize cloud security for many reasons. 
For example, in the traditional data center, you have a huge firewall in front of everything. So you know that many things, even if you get alerted on them, they just can't happen because there's something in front of everything that's blocking it. In the cloud, even answering the question of whether there is a firewall in front of everything is a hard question to answer. But that's negligible. The bigger things is are in, in the traditional data center, our applications were very monolithic. Whereas in the public cloud, usually we use microservices architecture, which means that there are way more components to monitor. We get events and alerts from way more components, which means much more work for the SOC analysts. And the relative freedom that we give to developers, and DevOps people in the cloud versus in the traditional data center, of course, comes with a cost associated with it, with a price associated with it, which is more alerts, more work at the SOC. So the bottom line is, it became very quickly apparent to us that if we, as an industry and as a vendor, want to continue to advance cybersecurity forward, we want to use more and more machine learning in uh, uh, detecting and uh, the, the, the detecting sophisticated attacks, in detecting the sophisticated adversaries. If we want to do more and more with cloud security and so on, we better automate everything because otherwise, we're going to stop here as an industry. You're going to stop here in your ability to deploy anything beyond the basic firewall, IDS, IPS, your filter, antivirus, identity and access management, vulnerability management, and maybe a few other components. And the adversaries, they're going to advance and we're going to lose them. We're going to lose the, the, the war against them. So automation became key for which we created what then became Cortex. Cortex is our brand for uh, SOC automation. And the vision behind Cortex is to get to a point where the SOC is autonomous. Very much like cars have been are, are becoming more and more autonomous with a vision of one day the, going, the car is going to drive itself and the only thing humans will do, whether in the car or in a call center, call center is get the car out of situations it cannot get out of automatically. Like for example, me standing in front of the car and not moving, you know, there's no driver to go out and push me. You need some human intervention. Um, uh, more and more uh, surgeries are becoming uh, automated. Airplanes have been flying themselves for uh, dozens of years now. And the only reason you have two pilots in the cockpit is to deal with extreme situations like the engines uh, turning off in the middle of the flight or if you need to abort landing. The SOC has to be the same. Security operations have to be the same. They have to be autonomous. Everything has to operate itself in the world for humans. I'm not saying less humans, but the same number of humans that you have in the SOC today, their role should be dealing with the extreme cases where automation cannot deal uh, with, with them, or the cases where automation cannot deal with them automatically. And, and that's our vision, and I think we're well on our way there. Uh, and for that, Cortex has multiple components. The two probably important ones for this discussion are XSOAR, which is our source, security orchestration of automation and response tool, which automates playbooks, it automates procedures, it automates things that uh, are today manual and repeat themselves in, in the SOC. And it turns out that about 90, maybe sometimes 95% of the work in the SOC is, is, is playbook-based, is procedure-based, even if the procedure is not written down anywhere, Still, when you get an IPS alert, you follow a procedure. When an employee forwards an email that they suspect is phishing, you follow a procedure. Sometimes it's written, sometimes it's not, but you follow a procedure. Another example will be, you get a new IOC from a threat intelligence team, figuring out whether the IOC is good or bad, and, and then if it's good, deploying it in the infrastructure has its procedure. So 99.5% of the work in the silk can be automated like that. And then we have all the work that cannot be automated with procedure, with, with the sword, because it doesn't have a procedure. I'm talking about things like uh, hunting for attacks, uh, taking events and consolidating them, consolidating them into incidents, prioritizing the incidents, and investigating attacks and incidents automatically. Those don't have a procedure. They don't have a playbook. They require today the human uh, brain to deal with, and it's different every time for those. What do we have? Of course, machine learning. And, and for machine learning, uh, uh, we need data. So we have XOR, which is the playbook-based SOAR uh, automation. And then we have XDR, which is all about collecting data and running a lot of machine learning. 
systems, right? So XDR is about collecting data from the infrastructure, very deep data, not the kind of logs that you send to the scene. Those are maybe useful for human analysts, machines that can deal with that. There's just not enough information in the logs. We need very, very deep data from the infrastructure, from the network, from endpoints, from the cloud, from applications, from IoT devices, uh, from identity and access management systems, and so on. Collect all that data into a single data lake and run tons of machine learning models to do all the different things that I talked about hunting and investigating incidents and coming up with incidents in the first place and so on. And that's what XDR is for. That's it. That, that's what Palo Alto Networks does. I think now you understand where we're coming from, why we're doing the different things that we're doing, and more importantly, where we're going with all these different products. We're going to add more subscription services on top of the firewall, whether it's the physical firewall, the virtual firewall, the Prisma access for more and more network security functions. We're going to add uh, more and more cloud security functions on top of the single agent, single console Prisma access, sorry, Prisma cloud solution. And we're going to add more and more automation, both playbook based automation, both machine learning based automation with more very unique, very deep data sources to make uh, SOC automation, SOC autonomy a reality. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I really hope to see each and every one of you in person. Uh, hopefully next year at the night. Uh, please stay safe and stay secure. Thank you.